It's now time for On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson. The conversation will range from local dialogue to international. This show is meant to enlighten, inform, and to inspire. On the Line with Cheryl Wilkerson begins now. Hello and welcome to On the Line. I'm your host, Cheryl Wilkerson. I thank you in advance for having me in your home, in your car, whatever you do Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. I don't take that for granted. I don't take that lightly. And I say thank you very much. I am so excited about today's show. Today, we are going to talk about Richmond royalty. You know how you go to every city and there's a family there that everybody knows or they know of them and they know of their accomplishments. That's exactly what we're going to do today. We're going to go and meet Richmond royalty. And this all started because I was scrolling on social media and I came across an event. I was like, oh, I want to go to that event because I saw where a book has been written about the family. And one of the family members was going to be there talking about the book. So I said, OK, let me go. Well, wonders to behold. It was a great talk. I bought a copy of the book. And today on the line, do I not only have Miss Betty Waller Gray, who was at the talk at the presentation, but I also have Miss Jewel Waller Davis and Miss Joyce Waller Baden. And I am excited. Welcome to On the Line, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. So, much. so these are sisters. Like I say, they come from Richmond Royalty and the family name is Waller. And like I said, everybody in Richmond knows that name. And we are just going to sit back today and you all are just going to reminisce and give me memories and give me stories. Is that okay with everyone? Sounds good. Okay. So what was the inspiration behind this book? The name of the book is Our Shining Legacy, The Waller Dungy Family Story, 1900 to 2020. What was the inspiration? Sure. Yes. We got started and with an interesting approach. We started with photographs. Now I know this might sound unusual, to do a book and started with looking at photographs and pictures and, and other memorabilia, but that's what happened with us. We gathered uh, four of the sisters, and there, there are five girls. There were five girls, but four of us gathered uh, 2011, and we all brought a stack of these pictures that we've been taking and collecting all these years when we were young. We took the pictures, we brought the pictures, we had planned to share them, and we ended up going to one of these stores that we could scan all these pictures. And the plan was that each of us would have a whole set of maybe 200 pictures right, and photographs, and we would all have them and have our own set. Well, several years went by, and I think the pictures sat on our, in our cabinets or bookshelves, <laughs> whatever. Okay. Finally, we looked at them again, and we talked. Now, that was 2011. And it took us about seven years. Yes. We said, let's do something about these pictures. And it uh, sort of dawned on us. The little red light came on and we said, these pictures tell a story about our parents, our aunts, our uncles, our grandfathers. We didn't know our grandmothers. They had all passed away. But we thought, let's tell the story. Let's tell a story about these wonderful, dedicated um, family members. So that got us into beginning to write. And Joyce and I did quite a bit of the writing. Betty researched and wrote. In fact, we all were writing, but some were doing more of the research. So that's how we got started. And four years, we were writing more research. And 2021, we had our book published. So that's the origin. That's how we got a book, Our Shining Legacy. That is a beautiful story. Can someone tell me about the family? How many boys, how many girls, where you live, that sort of thing? There were, yes, Betty. There was one boy, the first, and the first one was a boy, and of course, named Richard Jr. And then there were, five girls. Mm -hmm. And I often like to joke about the fact that, you know, okay, the second child a girl, the third child a girl, fourth child a girl. And then they tried, and then there were twin girls. And I joke to say, well, I guess my dad is giving up on trying to have that second boy, so we're going to settle for the one boy and the five girls. Can you imagine? (laughs) Can you imagine? (laughs) If you are that one son, can you imagine? And your parents, what were their names and what did they do for a living? 
short. Okay, our dad was a jeweler, Richard Waller, senior, was our dad, born in 1908. Our mother, Florence Dungey Waller, born in 1912, both of whom went to Armstrong High School in Richmond and attended for a while Virginia Union University in Richmond. And he was a jeweler. Was he self-taught? Did he go somewhere to learn this trade? How did that come about? Oh, my goodness. Well, then we have to go back a long ways to our grandfather, whom we termed a mechanical genius because at age eight, he inquired of his grandmother, could he uh, repair the the, the clock that was on the mantle? And, and she gave her consent, and he was able to fix that clock, and that probably was an initial motivation to do something mechanical. Uh, his, his uncle and his grandfather because our grandfather was reared by his grandfather who was a blacksmith oh okay but that business our grandfather was in beaver dam in hanover county virginia but moved to richmond at at an early age and began several businesses eventually beginning uh, a grocery store and there was a sign that uh, that he a newspaper ad that uh, had to do with the grocery store and Later on, he became a, a jewelry rep- repair person. That was his initial thrust. Joyce, I was going to tell Cheryl that we actually have in the book uh, a business card from a newspaper, a Richmond newspaper. I think it was the Richmond Planet from yes. 1896, yes. Um, the grocery store, our granddad's grocery store. He had worked there as, a, I believe, a porter, but then eventually he bought the store. He bought the grocery store. He also collected insurance. So he was really a Richmond entrepreneurial trailblazer. A spirit. And, and then by 1900, he opened, he'd been collecting uh, clocks and watches and repairing them. And then by 1900, he actually opened a store. I've heard about so that grocery had, store before. I heard that story, and I was yes. wondering how it came to be, and now I know. Yes, that's how. And, and he had nine, um, nine, he and his wife, our grandmother, Nanny, who passed away when before any of us were born, uh, but they had nine children, which included, I think it's six, six sons and three um, daughters. And not only our dad was in the business, but two of my dad's brothers, were also jewelers, watchmakers and jewelers. And that legacy continues today because you can drive to to Richmond, Broad Street, and go to Waller's Jewelry. I tell tell this story all the time because it's a true story. I have a nephew, and he's about 38, 39 years old. And I don't know what happened, but he came to Richmond, and maybe I had to get a chain fixed or something like that. Anyway, I took him to Waller's. Do you know every time he comes to Richmond, do you know where we're going? When he wants to get a present for his girlfriend who lives in Canada, do you know where he goes? Yes. Waller and Company. Yes. Wonderful. Yes. He really, really does. Thank you for that. (laughs) It's so cool. And this entrepreneurial spirit, it has carried down throughout the generations? Yes. Yes. Why why do you think that is? Well, we follow the good example from our granddad, our dad and uncles. And I also might add at this point, um, this is Jewel speaking, that I work in the business. My brother Richard, that owns the store now, uh, Richard and I worked in the business when we were preteens. We would go on Saturday and work and, and after school. So for several years uh, as kids, the two we were the two oldest, and we worked there in the business. Would you say so that, that you, was I'm sorry. our generation? Would that you, would have been the third generation. Would you say that you all had a happy childhood? Oh, definitely. definitely. <laughs> Without a doubt. I love that all of you chimed in on that. I absolutely love that. And, and why? And I wasn't, but I wasn't there very much because I was in Norfolk. I was the one reared in Norfolk. But when I went, it was wonderful. What made it wonderful? What what was it about it that made it a wonderful well, there was childhood? There was still fun. There was camaraderie. We played. We we went places. Mother always had something special planned. She never went shopping without bringing some little something home to us, um, a candy treat or a toy or a book, something for all of us. Sometimes we each got something. 
sometimes it was something we would share, but it was it was just fun. Remember uh, those bonbons? I do. I do. <laughs> bonbons and the donuts from the bakery. Yeah. And going to the park on Sunday afternoons, feeding the ducks after Sunday service, after we'd gone to Sunday school and to church and after dinner. And visited the family. We would often on Sunday because the jewelry store was down the street from our church. Mm-hmm. The jewelry store and two uncles, three uncles, lived there near the jewelry store on either side of the store. So on Sunday, we would walk after Sunday school, we would walk what, three or four blocks and visit our Grandpa Waller, our Uncle Junius and his wife, and our Uncle Tom and his wife, and our Uncle Clark and his wife. So we just had um, a wonderful childhood. We were quite blessed in that regard. Lots of interested um, relatives that cared for us, and we cared for them deeply as well. They were always encouraging us. But tell me this. What was it like living in segregated Richmond? I'm talking about the home of the Confederacy. I'm talking about the home where these giant statues of these evil men once stood. What was that like? Difficult. I'll let somebody else elaborate on it. And and tell me why it was difficult. In what way did it play out to be difficult? Libraries, bus stations, grocery, uh, not grocery stores, department stores. Everywhere you went, there was a, was a reminder of legalized segregation and discrimination against as, black folk. And as I can remember, uh, the park, Monroe Park, mm-hmm. that swing, those swings were not for colors. They were for the white kids. So we could not, you know, we, we might could walk through the park, but you were not allowed to to swing. And what I do also remember is when, when we moved to Rosewood Avenue, which was, you know, was about three blocks from Bird Park, there was a public swimming pool. But as soon as blacks started moving to the area, what did they do? They shut down the pool. Like, we're not going to have the colors swing in the pool, so they just shut it down. How did your mother explain all of this to you? If she's taking you to the park, and of course a child's natural instinct is to run to some swings, how did your mother, how did she explain this to you? Well, you know, we, we experienced it so much, and the one incident, I think it's in our book, was us getting on the bus, because my mother never really drove. And so we were getting on the bus to go downtown or go somewhere. And, of course, the three little sisters, my twin and the sister just older than myself, the three of us sat right up front, you know, on the side seat. Yes. And my mother continued towards the back because she knew the rules. But we had stopped. And what did the driver say? Those your children, get them on in the back where they belong. So that had an impact. So to this day, I do not like getting in the back of any bus. If I'm going on an excursion with my sorority or just anywhere, I do not like the back. Yeah, I can see. Well, one of the things one of the things that's so vivid to me as the oldest girl, I spent a lot of time with my mom going downtown shopping and with six kids, obviously. <laughs> she had to shop quite a bit, but she could not buy. She'd be a little hungry and want maybe a hot dog and chips. That was her favorite thing. She'd have to stand. She could order it, but she'd have to stand and eat. The whites could sit down. There were chairs and um, booths for the whites in the, in the restaurants and the stores. But blacks had to stand, and she would be so tired some days. If we wanted to go to the restroom, we'd have to go down to the lower level of the store, walk all the way to the back of the store, and then there would be the colored restroom. And we actually saw the signs that colored, colored, I don't think it said women, well, it may have said colored women. Of course, it didn't have the word ladies anywhere when it came to colored. Mm -hmm. But that was so heartbreaking for me because I knew mom would be tired. Uh, But that was, it was the way of life. And I often talked to people, yeah, and they said, how did you deal with it? How did you put up with it? But you didn't have a choice. I mean, we passed schools that were for whites and we walked halfway across town to Maggie Walker, you know, to our school. We could not go to other schools. Just uh, wasn't happening. Mm-hmm. Yes. Tell- it was the way it was. 
at Deutschmann's and bus station. Uh, we had very little interaction with white people on the, the bus, on the bus, and in the department stores. Of course, we could not. Uh, we meaning black could not even have uh, work in the department stores except. I recall some could do elevators, be the elevator operator, but they were, uh, I guess, maids in the stores, but they could not even be salespeople they could not in be um, stores. No, they could not be saleswomen. In stores that were supported in great measure by black folk, that was what, you know, you realize that the stores overflowing with people who looked like you, but the people who served you were not the people who looked like you. The people mm-hmm. who got paid by the store for the most part, we're of the other group. Tell me this. Was, you, you, you talked about the cha- happy childhood, and you're telling me about segregated Richmond. Tell me about the major loss that you had in your in your family, because I think your mother's just like a rock star how she did this. But explain to the listening audience about the major loss. I, I'll speak to that because, um, we had been to the Maggie Walker Armstrong game, and you know, if you lived in Richmond back in those days, the Saturday after Thanksgiving was green and white and orange and blue day. Yes. Everywhere throughout the city, there was nothing but orange and blue and green and white. And my parents had taken us to the, to the game, and I was so excited. Again, I was only nine years old, and I remember having a balloon and being afraid to blow it up because... You know, I didn't want to pop it. And my dad said, it's okay if it pops, I'll buy you another one. And I'm getting a little emotional. As well you should. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's but, um, so so my, uh, my dad was driving. I was sitting on the passenger front seat. And in the back was my twin and my mother. Because uh, Jules and Richard were seniors in, at Maggie Walker. And Lil and Joyce were in Norfolk with my aunt and uncle. Okay. So uh, Richard happened to see us driving, leaving the game. Walker had won the game, and so everybody was excited. Richard wanted the car. So my dad slid over to the middle seat. Back in those days, you had three seats up front. Mm -hmm. My brother was driving. As we proceeded down Idlewood Avenue, my father slumped over first on my shoulder and then my brother's shoulder. And I thought he was joking because he always joked. Okay. But my mother said, oh, my God. So she obviously knew. I was a nine-year-old kid. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I jumped in that seat because I said that he must my son and I started playing. And from that point, I just remember them taking my twin and me out of the car and we went to uh, a friend's. We were right around the corner from where we lived. This was at Adderwood and Roland Avenue, and we lived right around the corner on Rosewood. And your and, mother was left a widow, and she, and I'm rushing, not giving this to do justice because we're 20 minutes into the show, and I'm I, oh. I just trying to get everything in. But your mother was left a widow, and she took such extraordinary care of all of you all. And for that, I am just in awe. I just think that is outstanding. I mean, I know some people would say that's what she's supposed to do, but a lot of people don't do what they're supposed to do. And for her to raise you all in the manner that she has, because we see the fruit of that now, I just think she was just an exceptional woman. She absolutely was. And not only in terms of the six of us, but she was very active in the community, yes. the civic organization. She never missed a PTA meeting. She was remarkable. You're talking about a phenomenal woman. She, she's an example of one. And you all have followed in that footsteps. You all are civically engaged. Do you want to talk on that, please, before time runs out? Well, my mother received an award from President Truman in 1948 for her efforts to get people to register to vote. Mm, how dynamic. Um, you, you, of course, you heard the young lady's presentation on Saturday. I think you were there for the whole thing. Yes, ma'am. Beverly, who was a student of my mother's. Yes, ma'am. The kindergarten. Mm-hmm. And my mother took my twin and me to the march on Washington. And Joyce, who, of course, lived with my aunt and uncle, was also at the march on Washington with our uncle. And we've continued the specific activities. Oh. My mother always, as Beverly said, she would get everybody to pay their NAACP dues. 
time to compete. Yes, and and I've done my 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 twin and I did much of that. I would say for me, with uh, the sorority, the Girl Scouts, the Church Habitat for Humanity, any other, certainly church activities, but the other items as well, the other yes, activities as well. We are all very active in our churches. I, I still belong to Moore Street, which is where my grandparents both belong at some point. Mm-hmm. Uh, Girl Scouts, I'm on the finance committee with the church and the sorority. Uh, I helped start the teen center in Chesterfield back in early 95, I believe. I think it was the early 90s when my daughter was a teenager. So uh, we've all been very active um, in the community and the church. Jewel? Yes. And so for me, it's basically been the sorority. I joined Alpha Kappa Alpha at Virginia Union. Uh, and this we didn't talk about age at all, but this is my 65th year. Congratulations. Uh, now, um, Alpha Kappa Alpha, thank you. I'll be a pearl this year. That's, so, I was going to ask you, what is that called? My mom was a Delta, so I know I'm supposed to say a Delta deer with a Delta, Delta but deer. I, I didn't yes, know yes, about it. I'm the, the Delta. Okay. AKA the we've pearls. Got the, we've got them, them all. Joyce is the Delta. I'm AKA, and my twin was Delta. So we had two AKAs and two Deltas in the immediate family. That is beautiful. I want to fast forward to a story, and we hadn't discussed this, but can you all please explain to the listening audience what happened when everybody was bombarding downtown Richmond, Virginia, over the George Floyd murder, and crowds came to Richmond, and can you please tell everyone what happened to the store located right there on Broad Street. I almost need my daughter because that particular, the night before what happened at our store, my daughter decided that she alone was, and my brother has two sons, but my daughter decided that she was the one that was going to go downtown and stand in front of the store and guard the store. And she stayed a, a very long time by herself she wouldn't even let me go. But, um, and it's, apparently once she left, they had been watching. They vandalized the store. They broke into the store and vandalized it. Broke the store windows, broke the showcases, and those yes. cut glass is very difficult. But that's what happened. And that next day, the young people from sororities and fraternities from Virginia Union, uh, probably Virginia State, mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. University of Richmond and VCU came downtown and they actually began helping us uh, clean up and help, uh, helping us to sell. And I don't know if you've looked at the book in Tali, but the very last page in the book shows a picture of the members of the Divine Nine who came to our aid on that day, May 31st of 2020. And they asked me what could they do before they even began helping. And I said, you know what would be great? A GoFundMe page. Mm -hmm. And do you know that they started that GoFundMe and there was approximately $50,000 raised to help my brother restore his business from the loss at that time. I, I saw that picture. I had tears in my eyes because, like I said, I come there all the time. My nephew comes there all the time. Matter of fact, I shot nephew uh, a text about it, what was going on and everything. And when I saw the picture, I'm not even Greek. Okay, tears came to my eyes because nobody asked them to do that. They got together. There were Deltas with Qs, with Sigma. It was every, all All, of them were represented. All divine nine. Yes. Yes. It was a miracle of torch. Yeah, heartwarming to see that kind of support for my my brother and my family business. And that's got to let you all know, just give you an inkling of how much the Waller family is loved in Richmond. It's got you've got to know, right? Absolutely. Well, we spent lots of years there, as did our parents. They were both natives of Richmond. Uh, Lots of cousins, Dungey cousins. Not so many on the Waller uh, Waller side, but. Lots of connections there, and we spent many years, even like, though several of us moved away after college and lived elsewhere, but we still maintain that Richmond connection. And so I'm sure I... Go ahead. Excuse me. Go ahead. No, I would just think, I was thinking, because of integrity, honesty, service, uh, customer loyalty comes in because that's how we've been able to sustain the business. Customer loyalty. 
plus new customers, but the older ones, ones who have been coming, who continue to come, bring their families and come back and repeat in business, they know about us and, and what we represent. This family, like I said, you all are royalty. And Waller & Company, it what it is one of the oldest continuous small black-owned businesses in Richmond. I was so happy, Miss Betty, when you said Saturday that uh, Mr. Richard has actually bought the building. I mean, all of these things yeah. are, it just seems like you just keep climbing, you just keep growing. And what an example your family has put out there for not just Richmond, not just Virginia, but for the whole world to see. My hat goes off to you ladies. I'm so, I'm just so proud of you all. Well, thank, thank you. We appreciate that. And for your information, we also have uh, a Maryland sales license. We spent, and Betty and Joyce and myself, years doing various shows, particularly for the AKs and Deltas. We've been at various conferences selling. So the name has, we've been able to expand it. We have online sales now, online catalog. We've had for several years. So thankfully, uh, we've been able to expand the clientele to the D.C., Maryland area and beyond. Well, We're Waller very- Sisters, let me ask you this. Do you have another book coming? Do you see another book in the future? <laughs> You're going to write it with us? <laughs> <laughs> I'll leave that so to we're, you all. We're, we're, we're waiting for the uh, movie now. Yeah. <laughs> so once, once the movie comes out, then we, we may have a second book. <laughs> well, I am wishing you all the best. We have about two minutes left, and I'd like for each of you to just give some final reflections. And uh, while you're thinking about that, if someone can give out some kind of way to contact, people are listening, they might want to contact you, they might have questions, they might have read your book already and have some questions, how can they contact you? We can be contacted at the following email address, Outstanding Legacy at gmail.com. You can write that address. Send, send up any questions you may have. If you want to buy the book, we will instruct you as to the next steps that are needed. The oh. book is available in hard copy and, and paperback. All right. We've got about 30 seconds for each of you for final thoughts. We please. thank God for the uh, business and for all of those who support us and for all who are listening. And we we, we thank God for you, Cheryl. Thank, thank you. you. And I'd just like to say of all the obstacles that we face uh, growing up and that our forebears faced, we, we're thankful for their faith, their hard work, and for the legacy they've left us. And we thank you also, Cheryl, for today's opportunity. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to add the same ditto to what Joyce and Jewel have said. We appreciate you allowing us to be on your program. No, thank you, ladies. We've been speaking with Jewel Waller-Davis, Joyce Waller-Baden, and Betty Waller-Gray. They have written a wonderful book. It's called Our Shining Legacy, The waller Dungy Family Story, 1900 to 2020. You all, please delve into this. Hopefully, it will inspire others to get those pictures out. Go ahead and exchange those pictures. You don't know. You might have a book. You might have a movie in your pictures, your family pictures. So what you all have done today is lovely. I want to thank everybody who listened today, the best audience in the world. I'm Cheryl Wilkerson. We're signing off. As always, hold the green and gold.